After the turn of the century, gun companies like Remington and Winchester invested a lot of time, money, and engineering in getting self-loading rifles that worked very well, especially for deer hunting and personal protection. The Winchester version was called the 1907. Around the turn of the century, when self-loading pistols and, and rifles were becoming uh, the vogue, Winchester was right, right there at the beginning. And in uh, 1903, they came out with a lovely little blowback in, in 22 Winchester Auto. Uh, a couple years later, they came out with another one in 35 Winchester self-loader. And then in 1907, one in 351 Winchester self-loader. And again, even later on in 1910, uh, one in 401. They were blowbacks, and uh, especially in the heavy calibers, you know, because of that, they required a, a pretty heavy block to, to handle the, uh, the pressures of these guns, because the, uh, those cartridges, especially the 351 and the 401, were, were pretty serious rounds. So when you shoot the gun, I mean, it, it gives you a pretty good belt. The 1907 is, is pretty interesting all around in the fact that it appears on the civilian market a full year before any of the militaries of the world sit up and take notice to a semi-automatic rifle. And granted, fully automatic machine guns had been out there for a while, but uh, in Mexico, a General Mondragon you know, designed the first semi-automatic rifle that was ever adopted by a military force in, in 1908. And here we are with this Winchester in 351 that's out even a year before that finds acceptance. It was really developed for use by police. And although you have plenty of sporting variations of it, there was a police version that was set up with a mount to take a crag bat at. In World War I, the Russians got around 500 of them. Uh, the British Royal Flying Corps also purchased these, and they used them to arm their observers. The French adopt this by 5,000 of them. And instead of using the five or 10 or 15 round detachable box magazine, they come up with a 20 round, and Winchester converts them to fully automatic fire. They're also fitted to take a Lee Navy straight pull bayonet. And basically, one could think of them as kind of the, the precursor to the Browning automatic rifle. But of course, they're chambered in a cartridge which is not compatible with the US Army. Although the US Army did get a few of them during the punitive expedition against Pancho Villa, and they were used to arm the observers in the aircraft they were using at the time. Now we think of semi-automatic rifles as something that was developed uh, far into the 20th century, but really there was an innovator at Winchester by the name of Thomas Crossley Johnson who was developing semi-automatic actions long before anyone really considered them to be viable for anything, let alone military or commercial use. Thomas Crossley Johnson first innovated and pioneered some of the semi-automatic actions on a blowback principle with the Model 1903, which was a rimfire. And he built on this with the later Model 1905. Now the problem with the 03 and the 05 was they, they performed reliably and, and they were capable guns, except that they fired very anemic cartridges. And so Johnson went back to the drawing board and in 1907, he developed his blowback actuated action in his semi-automatic rifle and paired it with a much more robust cartridge in the 351 self-loader. 351 is a neat cartridge. Those that have been into ballistics and, and ammunition have always been flirting with the 35 caliber Townsend Whalen. Everybody had you know a 35 of some sort at some point. And this semi-automatic in 351 proved to be a, a very lethal round. It found a, a great deal of interest in law enforcement. Uh, the fact that it was semi-automatic, that it was short, that it uh, was fed from a magazine, was all very novel. 
at the time. And law enforcement, especially prison guards, you know, found, found great favor with it. Obviously, a gun like that was, it was good for sporting, and they found it was good for military. Well, in, in, the, in the 1920s and 1930s, the Desperados and bad guys figured, well, heck, this is a pretty darn good gun, so they were adapted, and later on adopted by um, a gunsmith called Hyman Lebman, and he produced kind of guns for the bad guys. And one of his specialties was the 1907. What he did with it was uh, put a, a heavy metal forehand tip on it, made out of zinc, I believe it was, and, and then it used a Thompson forehand grip. It made it very, very, very handy. Uh, matter of fact, um, pretty boy Floyd was, was actually killed. Supposedly he was carrying one of these rifles. Uh, in Dillinger's arsenal, uh, they found one. Matter of fact, Dillinger ordered one from him. Uh, Hyman Lebman always said, well, I didn't know I was making these for the bad guys. So he was brought up for trial a couple times, but uh, somehow exonerated and got away with it. The problem with the 1907 was that it was just a little too far ahead of its time. And one of the biggest problems that it faced in achieving commercial success in later decades was that it was a design entirely unlike anything else really out there. And when you see the commercial sporting rifle market really spurred by returning service members from the First World War, those are guys who have been trained and seen combat with bolt action rifles. And so when it comes to getting a sporting rifle of their own for hunting, they're used to the bolt action, so they want bolt action guns. And so that's why you see the bolt action sporting rifles from Winchester and from Remington really take off in the interwar years. And Johnson's 1907 just isn't quite familiar enough to any of them for it to see any kind of significant commercial success. The other problem with the 1907 is that it was expensive. Compared to bolt action rifles of the time, you were paying a premium in both the gun and in the ammunition for a sporting rifle. And that was just something that people weren't prepared to do, particularly as the Great Depression arrived. The 1907, despite some of these hurdles, ended up seeing a lifetime of about 50 years of production and finally ceased production in 1957 after almost 60,000 guns had been made.